So I just invite you to come along, be part of what God is doing. But missions is more than foreign missions. That's my heart. Africa is my heart. It wasn't always my heart. I got saved and I served here in the city and did a lot of things. Tried to play the Holy Ghost after I first got saved. That, you know, I got, I got righteousness now, so you need it. And I'm going to convict you of your sins. You know, <laughs> so the Holy Ghost has a way of letting you grow and learn. And, and pretty soon you learn that you just present the Word and let the Holy Ghost do the work. And He brings those that are ready. And uh, so we praise Him for that. But it brings you great joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. When you see the salvation of so many. And it, can you imagine, do you have a relative that is not saved that you've been praying for? Hmm? Who? See, look around you. Everybody's got their hand raised. Would it bring you joy if God saved them this week? Would it bring you greater joy if God used you to bring them to salvation? <laughs> yeah, there's a big amen, and it does. And so there's where we're at. That's uh, when I, the night I got saved, I see Dave Nordoff sitting back here. He wasn't saved then either. <laughs> but uh, we worked together, and then we went different places. And uh, I went to a different shop and worked. And uh, one night I came home. And instead of doing my usual thing of going downstairs and fixing myself a drink or something, and I came home early. What I call early is Lynn and Chad were already in bed asleep. You know? <laughs> but uh, I came in and I didn't go fix a drink. I walked into the living room and I sat down next to the fireplace and there was a Bible sitting there. Lynn and I, neither one can figure out how that Bible got out and got put there, but God knew. There was a time, a purpose, and a place. I picked that Bible up, opened it up, flipped through it, Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, let's don't be talking about my sin. Let's flip a few more pages. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, I still, that sin thing, I don't want to be talking about going to hell, you know. Let's turn a page here. Romans 10.10 for with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. The Holy Spirit had my number. <laughs> I mean, he was nailing me big time. And so, I said, well, okay, but I'm not as bad as everybody else. You know, yeah, I do my things. I drink, I smoke, and I run around and everything. But, you know, I don't murder people, and I don't rob banks, and, you know, I don't beat up people. All, and... So I flipped over a few more pages and it says, not by works of righteousness that you have done, but by the grace of God. So it, it just, he had my number. I knelt down there by the fireplace and gave my life to Jesus. Nobody there, none around, just the Holy Ghost bringing forth the word of God and, and opening truth to my eyes. And that's what is available to everybody that you know. But he has a plan. God has always used man. And, and, and for people like me, um, who read the Bible so I could argue with the Christians, and show them where they were wrong, <laughs> God showed up one day and showed me how wrong I was. And so it just, it, it, that's what he does. And so we have to reset a lot of things because when you come into salvation, when you become to know Jesus, your whole life begins to change. There's a transformation of the mind, right? Well, I hope there is. It doesn't sound like too many were too excited about that. Uh, there's, supposed to be a, there's supposed to be a transformation of the mind. A renewing of the mind. And that begins a process of your life changing. That begins a process of, of who you were 
into who you are and to, into who you're going to be. Because if you're still taking breaths, everybody go. <sighs> are you still breathing? God's still got a chance with you. And so he's going to do great and mighty things in your life. Not just for you, but for the world. Wow, is that, a, that time already? Woo. But, so I, I just wanted to share that with you to, to let you know there's a process that we go through. And God does it. He can do it at a moment. I, I just have never been more in awe of God that whenever I got something going on in my life, He reveals it, and then He delivers. And uh, I'll just give you an example. At that time, before I was saved, I was, uh, like I said, I was a smoker, and I tried to give up smoking a couple of times. And my wife was very adamant that I shouldn't smoke in the house and I shouldn't smoke at all, and she was very anti-smoking. But I tried to quit smoking once, and after about a week, she came back from the grocery store, and I was sitting on the couch in the living room, and she threw me a carton of cigarettes and said, here, I can't live with you. <laughs> you know, oh, well, well, what do you mean? You know, such a nice guy like me? And, and, uh, but when I got saved, <clears throat> I was sharing this with Pastor a couple of weeks ago. When I got saved, I didn't automatically give up smoking cigarettes. And I was still smoking. And one day I was witnessing to somebody, because that's one thing God did for me, is he made me a witness. I was witnessing to somebody, standing there, smoking a cigarette. And he's standing there going, <laughs> could not hear a word I said from my actions. Hmm. How does that convict us sometimes? How we're judgmental we are as Christians and everything. But he couldn't hear it. And I got convicted of my smoking at that moment. And I just looked at these cigarettes. I took them out of my pocket and threw them away. And I said, Lord, with your strength, never again. Never again. And that was... 48 years ago, and i never again. And she's still married to me, so I must be all right. <laughs> and so I lived through that. She lived through it, I should say. But after that, <clears throat> I had a man I worked with at that time invite me to a breakfast. And he said, well, let's go to breakfast. I said, okay, we'll go to breakfast. So I went... Full gospel businessmen's breakfast. I've never heard of such a thing. I'm brand new in this Jesus thing, you know. And so I, I'm at this breakfast and I'm sitting down right across the table from a Catholic priest. Boy, did my judgment come out. You know, I just, I was in the Methodist church and I thought they were bad. And... and yeah, you know, the preacher would preach on Sunday, and then he and I'd go to the fellowship hall and argue. And I'm a brand new Christian. <laughs> I felt I knew more word than he did, and he'd been through seminary. And, and so <clears throat> I'm sitting across from this Catholic priest, and Bill Johnson being who he is, sooner or later he's got to ask, what do you do with that scripture that says, call no man father? He answered me right away. Oh, we don't read that one. <laughs> so, but that day he was the man that prayed and I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in my judgment God showed me I cannot judge others that he has gifts for us that can come from anywhere I mean uh, Baal uh, rode the donkey and the donkey saved his life uh, you know <laughs> The, the gifts can come from anywhere. And so we cannot negate the power of the Spirit of the living God for all these things. But the greatest thing that that did that day, like I said, is when I received the baptism, yes, I received the power. 
I did. Didn't know how to use it, didn't have the understanding, didn't have the knowledge. But the one thing I did have, it says that when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you shall receive power to be witnesses. That's what our business is about. Healing is fine. Salvation is greater. The transformation of a soul. God cares more about our souls than he does this box that we live in that's going to burn up. And so we, we need to begin to look at that. That Yeah, I, I believe in healing. I see lots of healings. In fact, that last trip in May to Uganda, uh, I'll share this even now, that I saw probably a thousand healings. But I only prayed for two or three people. The last Sunday service we were there, I know I saw 80 or 90 people get, get healed and no one prayed for them. Is that a different way than what we do, church? God stretched me a long way right then. I thought I had to lay hands on everybody and pray for them and everything, but that's not what God wanted to do. But so we, wow. I got notes this morning for your benefit, not mine, because I tend to get a little long-winded. <laughs> I'm used to preaching in Africa where they want you to preach for two or three hours, you know. <clears throat> so you got to come prepared to say a lot. Chase rabbit trails and everything else just because you got to fill the time. But it's all the Word of God and it will accomplish what it wants. Well, I, it, it, the growing process continued because uh, I was at Rockford first at the time. I don't know what it's called now, City Church or whatever it is now. And, and uh, we went, we, we every year had a missions convention. Every year. And I got heavily involved in that, building the rooms and doing things and doing, having skills that I didn't know I had. And uh, we, we built these rooms and did a lot of work for missions and the ladies did things all year long and they did paintings and crafts and they sold them and everything got bought, you know, for the missionaries and they'd go away blessed. Well, one year they asked if I would keep a missionary in our home. I said, sure, we got the room. Just bring him on. And so we got to keep a missionary in our home for a little over a week and he was a missionary from Burkina Faso. My great knowledge of world geography, I had to go look up to see where Burkina Faso was. And, but in that week or so, in our home, he left a love for Burkina in our home that I couldn't get away from. And I found myself loving the Burkina people, having never seen it, been there, or anything. And so we went on, and I always said that as soon as there's a trip to Burkina, I'm going. And wouldn't you know, within a couple of years, here came a trip to Burkina. Could I afford to go? No. Did I want to go? Yes. Was I called to go? I had to check with God on that one. And he said yes. And it was because he had a growing time for me. He wanted me to see some things that would change my heart and mind towards a lot of things. And so I said yes to going to Burkina. Well, I couldn't afford it. So I said, what do we do? And I, uh, how do we raise funds? And I'm not a fundraiser, believe me. I have a hard time asking people for money or things. I really do. And, and so I, I just leave it to the Lord and he's always provided. Everything he gives is always enough to do what he wants done. And so that's where I live. But I'm saying, okay, how do I pay for this? How do I do this? Well, every night for years I had walked in, emptied my pockets of change and put them in the water jug. Remember the old glass water jugs? They all, they're plastic now, but they used to be five gallons of water and it was glass. That was sitting by our front, not by the front door, but right in the living room and I would drop my change in that. I had the bright idea of all of a sudden, of course it was my idea, not the Holy Ghost, you know, just, of taking this to the bank and seeing how much money 
was in there and maybe see what I could do about raising the rest. I took the thing to the bank and of course, you know, a, a big jug is heavy and they were pouring it out and when they got through counting, it was enough to pay for the whole trip. And that's my God. That's my God. He planted in my heart for years to go. And He made sure that the provision was there. And that I didn't have to depend on anybody but Him. And that's the lesson He taught me there. But we went to Burkina. And uh, we were building a church. It was a maps trip and they were building a church. And 100 to 150 yards all around us, there was a sea of people of color. Imagine that in Africa. Everybody had a dark face. <laughs> you know. Well, we were the show in town. These people had never seen a white man. They'd heard of him, but had never seen him. And at that time in Africa, in Burkina special, white men didn't work. You could hire a laborer for 12 hours a day, seven days a week, for $50 a month. So a white man didn't work. So these people had heard of us, heard we were in the area, and heard we were working and building a church. So they came to see the white man, and to see the miracle, white man working. <laughs> and so that was, but with all these people gathered around us every day on what, uh, I'll give it a Wednesday night, they, we decided to have a service. So we have this service, and the gospel is preached. Well, the man preached in his national tongue, and then it was interpreted into four other languages so that all there could hear, including English for us. And so we're, we're, we're listening to the sermon, and it came time, the altar time, they gave the altar call for salvation, and a man right out front jumped up real quick, stepped forward. He wanted Jesus. Well, after the, you know, everybody had done and prayed, and they were getting the information so they could follow up on these people, they couldn't communicate with him. And, and so they finally figured out, well, he knew French, and a few of them knew French, so they began to speak in French and communicated. And it turns out, that he had heard the sermon in his own language, even though it had never been spoken. God. My God. And so, he began to teach me about the supernatural. That he can do things that no one else can do. That he can make a mighty thing happen. And, and uh, that whole church scenario, I could go on, but... It worked a miracle. The, the pastor had tried to build the church three times, and three times it had been blown down, and that was prophecy of their prophet, of the animist, because he had cut down the tree that their ancestors lived in. It was a beehive sitting in his kids. And he'd cut the tree down to get rid of the bees. Well, that was their ancestor, so he made a big mistake. But God used the white man to come and build the church and get it built in a week's time, and he made honor, so there's a great church there now. It has grown, and God does mighty things. Uh, wow. So how do we move on? Uh, Romans 8.29 says that we are to be conformed to his image. You got that up there? Oh, eight nine. Okay, but yeah, 829. Yeah, he didn't have it. But okay, it's conform, we are to conform to his image. We are to put on his likeness. We are to change into his image and move forward that way. Well, how do we do that? How do we move? And I think God gives us a lot of ways to do it, but first of all, we have to pick up his heart. What is the heart of God? He left heaven to come and seek and save that which was lost. That's his heart. To give of himself in such a way that the lost are saved. The kingdom is built. So we need to put on the heart of God. 
and and give everything. Can you give everything? Jesus was God. He left earth. He gave everything for us to have salvation. And that's the way we're to live for others about us. And then we're to have the uh, mind of Christ. First Corinthians 2.16, you got that? Mm-hmm. Apparently not. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're, we'll keep going. But we're to have the mind of Christ. We're conformed to his image. We put it on his heart. We put on the heart of God that loves, the heart of God that brings forth. And then we put on the mind of Christ. And what putting on the mind of Christ in that First Corinthians, uh, there you go. We have the mind of Christ. Can you read that? For who hath known the mind of the Lord? That he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. It's not something that's coming. When you got saved, your mind transformed, and you can put on the mind of Christ. Think as he thinks. Know as he knows. You can know the mysteries of God. And so we have wisdom. We have knowledge. We have understanding. What was hidden is now revealed. You can know all things. And it's all given by the Spirit of God if you go to the verses 10 and 12. And we can judge spiritual matters. There you go. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. 11? Got 11? No. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Thank you. The spirit knows all the things of God. And he said that he would order your footsteps. He would direct your path. Or was it direct your <laughs> And so, it, it's a matter of, of putting on that mind of Christ. How many of us begin to be anxious for things and fear over things and move in different directions, worry about your bank account, worry about the price of groceries and gas? You know, we, we get our minds set on our circumstances too often. And the circumstance is that there's people all around us going to hell. And what time? Wow. My time is running fast here. <laughs> so we'll, put, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that where it is. But we can discern spiritual matters. But there's the third part. You have his heart, his mind. The third thing we have to bring into our lives is we have to have faith. Amen? Well, I've heard a lot of preaching how, and, and you can grow in, in this, but it is, uh, how many of you know what faith is? What does Scripture say faith is? There you go, the evidence, the substance and the evidence of things not seen. Isn't that what it says? Amen. It's the evidence and substance. You can feel it. Even though you can't see it, you can feel it. It's the evidence. It's the thing that will bring past the, the decision of the jury. It's evidence. It's the truth. And so that's what faith is. Did you know faith is a gift? Hmm? And a fruit of the Spirit? It's a gift of the Spirit. You don't have to work it up. You don't have to fly through it. But Romans says that to every man is given a measure of faith. God has already given you all the faith you need. 
You ever thought about it that way? How much, how much faith does it take to move a mountain? A mustard seed. If I held a mustard seed up here, the ones in the back wouldn't be able to see it. It'd be questionable with some of us on the front row if we'd be able to see it. So if all we need is a faith of a mustard seed and God has already given you faith, do you have enough faith? Do you have enough faith? Some of you don't sound convinced. You have enough faith already. I have seen God do great and mighty things and believe me, it had nothing to do with my faith. There's no way I could even think or imagine some of the things I've seen happen. You know, I, I just, uh, it, you just don't. I've seen rain without, I mean, yeah, I've seen rain without clouds. You know, I've seen healings that are unbelievable. I've, I've seen, um, well, in fact, that, that place where I saw rain without clouds, it still rains today, and it was full of cactuses before. And now you have pictures of it, and it's all green. I should have brought some. And, but God can do things. He can transform the landscape as well as the people. Because in that place where I saw that, these people were the Karamajo, and they were known to hate and kill Christians. They made their living by robbery, uh, violence, and murder. They went and stole what they wanted and needed. And that's how they lived. They hated Christians. They would rather kill a Christian than see or hear one. And God sent us there to preach the gospel. I didn't know this at the time. And I later tell Pastor Steve, the Ugandan I went with, that he knew it. And he just had me preach first just to see how many spears would come through the window. <clears throat> And so, but God worked a mighty miracle, and now there's churches all over that place. In fact, <clears throat> on the second trip in, they wanted to hold a baptism, and there was no place to hold it. But God gave me a dream that night. I, I don't dream, and if I do, I don't remember them. But God gave me a dream on where to build a dam and how to build it. <clears throat> Well, an earthen dam, it may hold for a few hours, you know. And so we went and we built this dam. And, of course, we're talking about a stream that's this wide and maybe that deep. So it's not in a lot of water. And when we got through building the dam, it had gotten up to my ankles. And I'm thinking, they're going to have baptism in a couple of hours. This will never work. But after the service, we went out to baptize <clears throat> and it was up to here. Enough to baptize people. Well, we had six people say they wanted to get baptized because these were hating people of Christians and they weren't sure that they wanted to become Christians and live amongst people who kill Christians. And so six of them said we want to get baptized. By the end of the day, we had baptized 56 the next day, a few more decided they wanted to get baptized. So we went to baptize, and we baptized another 31. And the next day, and so God just did a mighty work. And that's the God we serve. That's the God that wants to manifest himself in you. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Romans 8, 8, 18 and 19. <coughs> What does it say? Somebody read it, quick. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present times are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Who is it being revealed in? Who? Are you convinced? Who here? Us. The glory. Okay, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. 
Can you give me the slide? We're going to have to. Boy, time went fast. I skipped over a lot of stuff, but. You got the slide? Nope, okay. Did you know that the world waits for you? The world is waiting for you. What does that 19 say? It says the earnest expectations. At Christmas time, when you were a kid and you wanted a certain toy and you were certain your parents got it for you, did you run down and open the presents on Christmas Eve so you could sneak in to see if you got it? You had an expectation of getting this thing. <laughs> that reminds me of a quick story. The Bible that was out the night I got saved <clears throat> was from my aunt and uncle, who were Pentecostals. But they put it in a box that was just about the size of a, a thing I wanted. And it was under our tree for a week. My expectations just kept growing every day. Oh, my. And so on Christmas morning, I run and guess what's the first present I open? Tear into it. Disappointment. It was a Bible. But that night, 20 something years later, that Bible was sitting on the table. God had a plan. God had a plan. He's got a plan for your life. Part of that is that He wants to manifest Himself through you every day to everybody you meet. He wants you to show the heart and love of God to everyone. He wants you to, to witness and use healing if necessary. Did you catch that? Preach and use words if necessary. You've heard all these sayings. <clears throat> I have seen great and mighty things. And God will going to do greater things. We have entered a season that the enemy is coming full flood. Filth, just vulgar stuff. We know it's here already, but it's going to get worse and worse and worse. But God said, when the enemy comes like a flood, I will raise a standard against him. That standard is the rallying place, Jesus Christ. If the Spirit of the living God, which raised Christ from the dead, lives in you, how much more are you going to do? He wants to manifest Himself through your life in such a way that you affect your neighborhood, you affect your schools, you affect your workplace, you affect everything. When you enter a room, the, the very atmosphere of that room should change. I don't care how many Christians are already there, you're adding more of Jesus in. So when you enter any place, change the atmosphere. Don't even allow the enemy a place. And guess what? Scripture says he's going to run from you. Doesn't it? it? said resist the devil and he'll what? What's a flea? It's not just a little bug. He's going to cut and run. <clears throat> Marty, why don't you come? We didn't get all of this, but he in this hour the whole world, all of creation is waiting for you. For you. You can change the world you live in. You can change it for eternity. And all you have to do is let Jesus live in you. You heard pastor say it this morning, both of them. You can let Jesus speak to you. And when you hear his voice, you speak what he speaks. And it will come to pass. Isn't that scripture? We need to begin to live that this day and age. Now is the time, as Pastor preached last week, now is the time for God to manifest through you to a lost and dying world because they're waiting on it even if they don't know. Everywhere I go, and I go into villages that have never heard the gospel, the great response is just astounding to me. And I, I, I many times think, well, how come we haven't been here before? But God has a plan for a time and a place and an hour. 
And today he has a plan for your life, a plan for peace, a pl which is his presence. There's only full and complete and whole peace when Jesus is there. When God's in the house, there is no lack of things. And so invite him in. Every day, get up and begin to plan to let Jesus shine through you. Everywhere you go, with whoever you talk to, and listen for the words to speak because they will bring life. And you will begin to have rivers of living water flow through you. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for joining us on our live stream today. Our hope is that you will discover life in Christ. If you have a prayer need, please take time to fill out a connection card from our website, or you may also send an email to prayer at rockchurch.net, and one of our pastors will follow up with you as soon as possible. For more information about our church, please visit our website at rockchurch.net. We hope to see you in person for one of our live services on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. God bless you today.